management. And in this context, conflict management in family. That is what we want to share together briefly before we pray. And God is going to bless us. I'll be looking at two scriptures. Genesis uh, 13, verses 7 to 9. And then Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 20. And get some few principles from those scriptures. Then we'll be praying together in the name of Jesus Christ. You'll all agree with me that conflict is inevitable. Conflict is bound to happen where two or more people are living together. When you have a neighbor, you have a wife, you have a child, you're in a church like this, conflict is inevitable. And how you manage conflict matters a lot. And as I was reflecting on the sermon we had last Sunday, unpacking old baggage, and asking myself, why are people still fighting? Why are the wars here and there? And I realize it's because probably the way we manage conflict matters a lot. Because conflict will be there. You'll differ with your wife. You'll differ with your child. You'll differ with your church member. You'll differ, differ with your supervisors in one way or another one. But when you know how to manage conflict, that becomes something so, so powerful. So this morning, I'll be helping us to see how we can manage conflict in a biblical way as children of God so that we don't engage in things that God doesn't expect us to engage in at this time. I want us to open the book of Genesis, a beautiful story of, um, of Abraham and Lot. And we can learn some few lessons from that portion of the scripture. Genesis chapter 13, just allow me to read the two verses, that is verses 7 to 9, but if you get time, you can read the two script, the, the entire chapter and see how the two people are engaging in this moment they were in. Verse 7 says this, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, so disputes broke out between the headsmen of Abram and Lot. At that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. Verses 8. And I like the word finally. Because the man of God was managing the conflict in a very powerful way. The Bible says, finally, Abram said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our headsmen. After all, we are close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want and we'll separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll take the land on the left. A very good case study on how you can manage conflict when conflict come to you. Looking at these two men, Abraham and Lot, Abraham was walking in the spirit as he's handling this nephew of his. He's telling him, young man, there's no big issue. Why should we fight? What is the cause of our fight? I'm, I'm, I'm willing. If you think where you are seeing is what, where you want to go, I'll release it to you. It's no problem because the main thing we want to live at peace. You're my relative, close relative, not somebody from very far. But Lord was walking in the flesh. He was, he was not understanding what Abraham was trying to bring as they are talking. And I came to realize that conflict comes because of the war between the flesh and the spirit. Do you hear what I've said? Conflict comes because of the war between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is leading you to do this way. But the flesh is telling you, hey, was a canny, this cannot happen. How can he abuse me? How can you treat me like this? And you're a child of God. And something inside you is telling you, no, take it easy. Take it easy. You're a child of God. And this is what we are seeing in this portion of the scripture. The outward cause was the increased wealth. It is good to have wealth. That is powerful. And this is what Lord was looking at. Lord was looking at the vast land. Huge land that was there. 
But the man of God who was walking by faith, Abraham, didn't see that. He just told his nephew, please, let us not have this, this, this conflict. Just take as much as you can. Because Abraham knew very well that he has a God in heaven who has always remained faithful to him and who has always blessed him. So the issue was not the land. The issue was how am I going to manage this season of my life? Because if he could have managed it wrongly, then probably he could have missed where God was taking him. So we are saying sometimes the real cause of conflict as we see in the life of Lot, is unbelief and, uh, and carnality. When people are walking in an unbelief, you don't believe that God will do something tomorrow. Because let me tell you these children of God, we are always in seasons. And seasons comes and go. And if you know that I'm in this season for this particular time, and you know God is with you in that season, you'll not walk in unbelief. Abraham, a man of faith, is seeing what God is going to do beyond what Lord is seeing. And I want to encourage us this morning. Let us not walk in carnality. If we want to, to, to manage conflict in whichever format that it comes to us. Our attitude should always be of belief when it comes to conflict. Somebody say amen. You have differed with your wife. You don't know what to do. Our attitude should always be that of belief, saying, God, I believe you. Things are tough now. It's like we are not getting well. But God, I believe that you can transform my husband. You can transform my wife. That attitude of belief is very, very important. There's this story. Some of you might have heard of this story of a lady who was married to a drunkard. And this man used to drink a lot, but this really was given to the Lord. And every time people could come and tell her, we have seen your husband in a bar. This lady always could say, no, my, my husband was not drinking beer that you're thinking. My husband was just taking soda. So every time he talks about that, he's saying, no, my husband is a pastor. Don't worry. A time is coming that things are going to change. And uh, the story goes on and on and on. And a day came when this man who was a drunkard just came and said, God, I need in my life. And the prophecy of the lady came true that the husband who was drinking in the bar was not a drunkard. He was just there by misplaced priorities. But this man was a pastor. And a day came that the man was born again and after some time in their life, the man became a pastor. Somebody say amen. What am I trying to say? Our attitude, and some of us who are sitting here this morning, the reason why we keep facing conflict right, left, is because of our attitude. We should always be believing in God, that things can change. Yesterday, you didn't talk to your wife, but have this belief that tomorrow, things will cool down and we'll come back again together and move forward. I, I want to give some definition of this word conflict as I got it from one of the dictionary, so that as I, as I continue what I'm sharing, you can also understand what I'm talking about. According to the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, conflict is war. So when I'm talking about conflict, I'm talking about war. I'm talking about battle. I'm talking about struggles that people are going through. Maybe you're not in a war. Maybe you're not in a battle. But you're struggling. Either inside or outside. An example of the meeting of oppos opposing ideas or beliefs. You're saying this. Somebody's saying this. You're saying this is what I believe in. Somebody's saying this is what I believe in. Disagreement, argument, quarrel. That is conflict. And many of us sometimes find ourselves in those scenari scenarios whereby there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of argument, a lot of quarrel. And you wonder, why all this? Another meaning is to be in opposition to one another. You're opposing the other person. That is conflict. A conflict can also be described as a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's or the team's goals or desires. When there's a frustration in the purpose of a team or in the life of someone, that becomes a conflict. And this morning we are asking ourselves, how can we manage conflict? 
And this takes us to the next point. What is conflict resolution? How can we resolve conflict when conflict comes to us as children of God? You know, it is, it is important to know that conflict resolution is the art or knowledge of resolving or managing conflicts. When you have the knowledge or the art of managing conflicts, then that is resolving that problem you have. Further, it is very clear that in life, there are conflicts of a personal nature, whereby it is all about you. It's all about what is going inside of you. you, you you're facing a lot of struggles. You don't know why you're going through these struggles. And also there are conflicts which we encounter and deal with as family members. There are conflicts that come because of mother-in-law, your husband, your sister-in-law, your brother-in-law, your children. There are those conflicts that come. But as a child of God, you need to understand how can I resolve these conflicts when they come to us? And for the sake of our sharing this morning, I'll be looking at the latter one. The one that deals with family members, the conflict which we encounter and deal with as family members. Because that is very, very important. And as Christian families, because I know I'm speaking to Christians this morning, we are going to be guided mainly by the biblical approach to conflict resolution. I know you are probably seated here this morning, and yesterday you had some serious argument with somebody, but you are seated here this morning. I want to help you understand what is God saying when it comes to managing conflict? How can I go about this when I face, I found myself in the, in the shoes of Abraham? Whereas by somebody saying, no, I need this land. Somebody saying, no, this and that. How can you go about that as a child of God? To succeed in conflict resolution, you should look at the interest as opposed to the positions. Many times, people hold to some position so dearly to the expense of not looking at the interest at that particular moment. Have you ever found yourself in a place, like say in a closed place, the place is a bit stuffy, and uh, one of you is saying, please, can we open the window? The other one say, no, let's not open the window. It's very cold inside here. And looking at these two people, they have different position. The other one is saying the room is so stuffy. The other one is saying, if you open the window, the house will be very cold. So it calls for some serious thoughts in this situation, whereby the two can agree and say, how can we avoid the cold coming in the house, but also have some fresh air coming in the house. That's what I'm talking about, that conflict resolution, we should look at the interest and not the position we hold. It is true you have your position. I don't want to be in a closed kind of a house. The other person is saying, I don't want cold. So the best thing to do is either to go and open the door and leave the window closed because that is the problem with the other person. You go open the door, you'll still get your fresh air and the window will be closed and that problem will be solved in a very amicable way. So I'm saying this, children of God, it is important every other time that you focus on interests, not on positions that people have. Somebody say amen. Daniel chapter one. I'll not be reading the entire chapter, but I'll be picking some few verses here and there. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 going downwards. The Bible says these beautiful words. Daniel chapter 1, and verses, beginning from verses uh, number 3, but allow me to read verses number 8 as we move forward in the name of the Lord. This is what the, the word of God is saying in verses number 8. Because there's a serious conflict here. There are guys who are brought from a foreign land. They have come in a land that is not their land. And they are forced to do certain things. There are things they are told to do. 
There was a war. And they were told, if you don't do this, the king will be on you. And see what Daniel is saying in verses number 8. After those many dramas that were happening, the Bible says, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself because he knew he's a child of God. He believed in God. By eating the food and the wine given to them by the king, he asked the chief of the staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Look at what Daniel is saying in verse 7. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Anania, Michelle, and Azaria. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendants agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. This is a, a situation where there is conflict. But the way Daniel manages this conflict speaks of volumes, which we as children of God can borrow from and tell God, when I find myself in such a situation, what can I do as a child of God? Because many a times you find yourself in a very compromising situation. You find yourself in a place whereby there are some contradicting or conflicting things in your life. What do you do? We can borrow from the example of Daniel. How did Daniel succeed in overcoming conflicts that he was going through as a child of God? In verses 8 where we have just read, one thing that the man of God did, he decided, he resolved in his heart. Listen to me, somebody. We sometimes need to reach a place, a place of making a decision that I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to reply back. I'm not going to do anything that will go against what I believe as a child of God. And Daniel decided not going to defile himself. Because he knew if he didn't handle that well, there's a high probability that he could have defiled himself. But the question is this, what is your bottom line as you approach conflict as a child of God? Every time you approach conflict, what is your bottom line? Where do you draw a line when you approach conflict? Because I've said conflict is war, conflict is battle, conflict is struggles. When you approach conflict, where do you draw a line? Because it can be a spiritual battle, a physical battle, or any kind of struggle. When you reach there, how do you draw the line? And Daniel is a good example. He knew that now where he is, his faith is being tested. And he knew that for this case, I have to, to do something different. And we see how Daniel is trying to handle this thing. Daniel came up with a very creative alternative. He said, guys, why can't you test us? I don't see the reason for us arguing a lot. Test us. We don't refuse eating. But because of this season, can you just allow us to eat vegetables for 10 days? And after 10 days, come and see how we look. If, if, if something will have happened bad to us, probably we will go back to what the king wants us to do. Daniel knew very well that he's fighting the spiritual battle. And listen to me, children of God. Sometimes in our lives, there are battles that we face every other day. Battles that want to compromise your faith as a child of God. Battles that want to compromise your faith as a daughter in that house. But at times come in life whereby you need to make a decision. You, you, you need to make a resolve and say, God, help me to be creative in this situation. Somebody say amen. Imagine you're a husband and something happens in your family. Something that is very serious. And you're wondering, how will I go about this thing? 
Should I beat or fight my wife? Should I chase my wife to go to their home? Those things are really running in your mind. But because you're a child of God who has the spirit of God, you reach a place and say, no, I should draw a, a line here. I should be creative and then see what probably should happen as we move forward. And as you, 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 you become creative in the wars and the battles you're going through, in the struggles you're going through, I strongly believe we have a God who always gives answers. Somebody say amen. We should strive to go for win-win situation every other time we're in a conflict. And this is what Daniel is doing. Daniel is trying to see how can both of us win. Their problem is that if they don't eat the food offered by the king, Daniel and his brothers will be pale and thin. But Daniel also gives an alternative. He's saying, guys, just give us 10 days. If after 10 days you'll find us pale and thin, please change the menu again. So he's looking for a way that both of them will be on the winning side. When they come after 10 days, they'll find these people very healthy and energetic. And this is what always should happen. That as you're dealing with conflict, try as much as you can to go for the win win situations. Don't always be there on the, on the side of saying, it is my side that should win. It is me that should have the last word here. That one, you'll remain in that conflict until probably Jesus comes. Look at verses number 14. Because we are seeing how this man of God is speaking. Daniel is speaking the Lord of Wisdom. Then attended, agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. Ladies who are here, sometimes we should speak with wisdom and tact when we're in a conflict. We should not just be people who are throwing words here and there. Daniel is speaking with wisdom, with a lot of tact. He's telling guys, I understand you. I understand what the king wants us to do. But can you please just allow us these 10 days? And we are seeing in the process, these people accept the wisdom and the tact that is coming from Daniel. Some conflicts just need wisdom and tact on how you manage it. Instead of going into war and fighting, you just say, my husband, it is true you want to buy that land. Can we do this and that? Can we try this and that? And that becomes a blessing. You know, last time, last year, We were thinking of putting a house here in Eldoret. We have a piece, a piece of land here in Eldoret. And you know, I'm that man who when he decides to do something, he goes for it. So I told my wife, you know, we should not continue renting. We should build immediately. My wife come and came and told me, Pastor, please, please, vumilia kidogo. Just vumilia. And then she told me, Pastor, you know, at home, you only have two-bedroom house. Why can't we just put our, our small dream house? It's not the real dream house, but a small dream house. Why can't we put one at home? I heard him slowly speaking. Then something came into my mind. And I said, let me hear this lady who is talking to me. Because women sometimes have six senses. And I said, okay, that's what he want us to do. So I transferred the money that I was going to use to build a house in Eldoret and took it to home and put a house at home. I didn't know that I'm going to be transferred to Kericho. <laughs> you know, Kericho is just home by the way. For those who don't know, Kericho is home. So I didn't know, I didn't know. So later on, I come to realize if I could probably not had my wife, Saiz Nukona Jipanga, the way things are going to happen. So what I'm saying, sometimes it's good to use wisdom and tact to make sure that things are done. She convinced, she convinced me and I took her word and uh, we thank God for that. Somebody say amen. Move to know why. In verses 15, the Bible says, at the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. We see when you, when, when you move knowing where you are going, it's a blessing. When do you get to know the way? Is when you relax and try to convince somebody in wisdom. 
you talk with your child, we talk, you talk with your husband, you talk with your wife, and, and, and you'll get away out of what you are doing. And I say this with all humility, that every time you're faced with a conflict, don't just be that rushy woman, rushy man. Please try to bring some sense of wisdom in what you are talking about. Try to bring some tact on what you are talking about because that will change so many, many things. In verse 16, something is happening there. What is the time limit we are dealing with? The man of God said, please give me 10, 10 days and come and see if I'll be the same or different. Sometimes when you are dealing with conflict, just forgive me for these 10 days. If you don't see me changing, take action. It's always good to have time limits when dealing with conflict. Some of us don't care. We don't talk for two weeks. We don't talk for one month. We don't talk for three months. You don't care. You owe somebody some money. This guy is just quiet. I've been dealing with one of my tenants in Kisumu. A very serious thing, by the way. It is true COVID was there. But that's not a reason of somebody not paying your rent. And I've been pushing this man every time, pastor. And the bad thing is a pastor, like me. So, so sometimes dealing with pastors is very hard. Pastor, pastor, just, just understand me. After this month, I'll come and do this. We have reached somewhere with my wife. We have said, this conflict... It's taking us too far. And we are praying about the next stage. I don't want to, to unveil the, the, the old story here of what is happening. But what I'm saying, what is the time limit we are dealing with as children of God? That when something comes, you differ with your child. For how long will you be in that kind of separation? For how long will you not talk with your wife and husband? For how long? Because the time limit should also be there. And from the example of Daniel, we are seeing Daniel as he's handling this conflict. Daniel is giving a timeline. He's saying, just give me 10 days. We should not just be in a conflict forever and ever. Verse 17. We see something also happening there. I like how Daniel is managing this conflict. And I want to ask you, who is your friend when you're dealing with conflict? Who is your friend? Look at what's happening in verse 7. Let me read that portion. God gave. Can you say God gave? These four young men, please, there are people that God gives you in your life. And those people are very, very important. And you should ask yourself, who are my friends? When I'm facing conflict, who are my friends? When you're fighting with your wife, who are your friends? We always tell young people when they are preparing for premarital class that the very important people in your life when you want to marry are the best couples. These are people when things in Mumana Kwa Nyumba, you can run to them and tell them, guys, things are not working because conflict is inevitable. It will be there. And Daniel here, thank God, God gave these four men an unusual aptitude of, for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. Who is your friend? A person who has interest at your heart. Somebody that you can consult. I see Daniel consulting these four men. In addition to that, Daniel is consulting God. God who gave him understanding. God who gave him wisdom. Daniel consulting his closest friend. And I tell us this morning with all humility, you need to ask yourself, who is my closest friend? And I want to propose to us that our closest friend in this life is our Lord Jesus Christ. We should always be running to him when things are tough, when things are difficult, rest, run to him. Daniel also prayed. He was a man of prayer. He knew that certain things cannot go without us praying. So he took time to pray. And because of his prayer, God also revealed some mysteries in his life. Let me just go to the next point because of time. What are some causes of conflict in, our, in families, in homes, in places of work? What are some of the causes of conflict? Just mention them. Maybe you have one that you're facing now as I'm talking. Number one is misunderstanding. Either between the nuclear family or extended family. Between couples 
or extended family between bosses and their and their juniors misunderstanding when there is a misunderstanding that is a cause of conflict contradictory interest most so when it comes to money there are people who are good in using money and there are people who are good in preserving or saving money and sometimes you find people have very contradictory interest when it comes to the issue of money. But I want to encourage you, you are seated here. The wife wants you to do this, you want to do this. The husband wants you to do, to do this, you want to do this. Your father wants you to do this, but you are saying, I want to do this. That is a serious thing. Contradictory interest over every, anything that you think about. Incompatibility. When you are not compatible, that also becomes something very, very tough. I was reading Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 6 and verses 24 and 27. Just allow me to read that portion for you to understand what I mean by this word incompatibility. The Bible says in verses 24 of uh, Ephesians chapter 6. I think I misquoted the wrong scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27. The Bible says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. That is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26, not 6. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And the story goes on and on incompatibility you cannot agree on anything you cannot sit down and talk together and say yes we're in this problem we're in this situation how can we come out of it something very very important dissatisfaction sometimes we find ourselves in conflicts because we are not satisfied we find ourselves missing something that we needed at that particular time lack of trust suspicion he said to be the breeding ground of conflict. When you don't trust your child, you don't trust your wife, you don't trust your husband, you don't trust your pastors, you don't trust your leaders, that is, that is a breeding ground of conflict. And I want to encourage us children of God that we can deal with them as they come. Another cause of conflict is communication gap. If people don't talk, just wake up early in the morning, you go to work, you come, you take your dinner, you go to sleep. No communication. That is something very, very serious. Unfaithfulness. And this is killing so many families today. Infidelity. When, 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 when one of the family realizes that my spouse is unfaithful, that becomes a root of conflict. And if not managed well, we have seen families separating we have seen families divorcing. We have seen family killing each other because of this aspect of unfaithfulness or infidelity. Unforgiveness, powerful virtue. That when things happen, can we give a room for forgiveness and say, please forgive me or I forgive you. You can look at the scripture at your own time and read it. Financial challenges can also bring conflict. Lack of genuine love. Genuine love. Last Sunday the speaker talked about just being, being open to each other. When we have lack of genuine love, there's always conflict. Even in a church like this, when our love is a leap kind of love, I tell you you'll always be having conflict here and there. When you're with, with Pastor Ibrahim, you pretend you love him very much. When Ibrahim goes Kidogo kando hivi, you bite him properly. That is not genuine love. Because when we talk about genuine love, is whatever I tell you now is what I will tell you even tomorrow. Nothing, no adding, no subtracting, because that's what God expects from us. Let me finish with this because of time. Biblical ways of managing conflicts in families. Because that is very, very important. Because if you cannot understand how to manage conflicts when they come, you'll miss what God is doing in your life. And the first way 
to manage conflict in a biblical way is to glorify God. Somebody say amen. I didn't hear amen from this side. Can somebody say amen? amen. This is what God is saying. When you are going through battles, when you are going through struggles, when you are going through war, that is not time of arguing and telling people how you are passing through a lot of problems. That is a time to glorify God. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a very powerful scripture. The Bible says these beautiful words. That is uh, verses 31 of uh, chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of whom? God. So when you are facing conflict, please glorify God. Even if you are not talking with your wife, glorify your God. Even if you are facing some financial challenges, glorify your God. In whatever you find yourself, the best way to deal with that conflict is to glorify your God. The second thing is to get the log out of your own eye. Many times, we try to think we are the angels and the others are demons. So every time, niwewe, niwewe, but you're forgetting that you're the cause of what you're going through now. So as a child of God who wants to manage conflict, please, before you begin pointing fingers, ask yourself, how have I contributed to this? Remove the log out of your own eyes. Jesus said that very well in Matthew chapter 7 and verses number 5. Jesus said, Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Many times we are very quick to say, Oh, Pastor Ibrahim, oh, Pastor Patrick, we forget to look at ourselves. My wife, Pastor, my husband, Pastor, my daughter. Before your daughter or your son became what he or she is, can you ask yourself, what am I contributing that is making things to happen the way they're happening? So please get the log out of your eye if you want to deal with conflict in your life. Somebody say amen. Just help me to preach to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, my neighbor, can you get the log out of your eye? Very, very important, by the way. Because if we don't do that, we are not going to move either at a family level, at a church level, at, at a work level, we are not going to move. Number three, go and show your brother his fault. If I've wronged you, come to me and tell me, Pastor Ibrahim, uliniumiza. Uliniumiza, Pastor Ibrahim. And because I'm a man of God, I'll say sorry for what I did. Instead of just, you're dying, you're battling. When you see Pastor Ibrahim, you want to hide, you want to do anything, that is not godly way of handling conflict. When there's a problem, just go and show your brother his fault or her fault. Tell her, please, what you did yesterday was not very good. And I'm coming asking you, please forgive me. You go to your husband. Your husband is bitter probably with you. Just tell your husband, the reason why I'm bitter with you for the last four days is because when you came, this is what happened. And you talk as, as, as a people. And by talking, God also comes and blesses you. And the last thing I want to mention is that go and be reconciled. Somebody say amen. Anytime you are handling conflict, make sure you go to a place of reconciliation. Either between you and your children, between you and your mother-in-laws, between you and the leaders above you. If you want to experience God in this life, go and be reconciled. I know probably you are here. You're going through some wars. You're going through some battles. There are some struggles you're really facing as a child of God. And you're asking yourself, how will I manage this conflict? God is telling us this morning, children of God, that it is important for us to go and reconcile. Let's stand up together in the name of the Lord, even as we pray in the presence of the Lord.